going back to your your training history, your time at OSU was that before you broke your back as assistant no, strength after. coach? What was the recovery like from your back? Yeah, incomplete. Yes. Well, I did um, read in that one article that you were allowed one hour up a day. That was the state of sports medicine then. Back then, yes. yes. Yeah. They wouldn't, they wouldn't dare do that now. Yeah. They'd get you moving immediately. Uh, it was incomplete, and I... A lot of times, doctors don't have a full understanding of what we want to do as athletes. They don't really understand why you'd want to bench more than 500. They don't really share the same vision of what we want to get back to. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The doctors are like, well, if you can walk and you can be generally active, we're, we're fine. You shouldn't want so much, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, stop lifting. How many times, how many people that are listening to this now had an injury and our doctor said, you got to quit lifting shoulder, knee, mm -hmm. back, whatever. Got to quit lifting. You can't do that anymore. Now it's over. And so I got that, of course, too. Mm -hmm. You know, you're done. You know, dump that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it turned out not to be true. But a, a lot of times we have to take people's word for it who are in a state of authority. Because mm -hmm. we can't know everything for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. That's the best way to know something is to know it for yourself. But, you know, when you're a kid, you, you don't know much. And you have to listen to people who seem to know much. And so these people are telling me, I got to stop this. And I can't do this. And you can't do that. And so I... I I sold out to a incomplete recovery. I'm never going to get this back, and I'm this and that, and and that's what I got. I got an incomplete recovery. So all the sports that I like to play around in couldn't do, but I could lay on a flat bench with complete support and push up. I could do that. Mm -hmm. That's what I had left, and it's about all I had left. So through through attrition of all the other things, I ended up specializing in one thing that I still had. Make the most of the thing I can still do. I hurt my back and somehow, some way, I found something that was that took me to lots of different places. It's why I'm here now. Yeah. I'm here now because I did that thing with, with bench pressing. I did the thing in bench pressing because I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't do anything else because I hurt my back. At what point did you know that the bench pressing was going to be that thing? Never. Really? At no point. At no point. I never expected it. I never predicted it. I, I engaged in it. I enjoyed it. I, I started to do fairly well in it. And then at some point, somebody points it out to you. Mm -hmm. Hey, you've got a chance to... Break the state record. Mm -hmm. 552 and one half. Do you remember who did that? What's that? Who Pointed said that? that out to you? Dominic Rotolo. Mm -hmm. let's, let's give him the credit for that. Mm -hmm. He said, he said, you could, you could be, I did a, I did a bench press meet because Anna was doing one, my wife at the time. She had qualified for the American Open in Olympic lifting, but she qualified at such a low level. She, she left like, 40 kilos on a table of her total. I'm like, you did that in the gym. What? I'm just too, too nervous, too nervous. So I said, why don't you do some of these bench press meets, just lift in front of people. Mm -hmm. Get used to being in front of people. When it's your turn, it's your turn. So she was doing it. And I was a week after my bodybuilding show. And I was down to 220. And I said, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a bench press meet. And I laid flat on the bench, no technique, no nothing. And I did pretty well. And Dominic said, you know, that's, if you put, if you put a couple pounds on that, you could compete. I'm like, really? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. I didn't really believe him, but uh, Anna did well too. <laughs> and and she, you know, she was world class long before I mm -hmm. was. And uh, so I just started hanging around powerlifting people a little bit for for her sake, you know, and trying to learn yeah. a little bit about. It. And at the same time, I kept lifting a little bit. And I was doing okay. What was the catalyst, though? Because there was a tipping point to where you went from just benching to being all in Yeah. for the benching. That's a good question, Dave. Now, it, it snuck up on me. Yeah. That's what I'd have to say. And so it's, it's going to be hard for me to identify the, when that happened because it was so gradual, like the, the frog in the tea kettle in, mm -hmm. in the boiling water. I don't know when I knew I was in trouble. 
and I should have jumped out a long time ago. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember that. It was so gradual, and I had such low expectations for myself. As a coach, I really try to do a better job for my athletes in getting them to expect more from themselves. We, we sell ourselves so short. I did it. My athletes do it. It's easy to sell ourselves short. And we talk about the reasons for that. But people do it. And I did it. And I, I, didn't, I didn't dare to dream big at that time. I knew I wasn't doing it. And I knew I should be doing it. And then I worked myself into it. Mm -hmm. And that happened at 600. I, I just, I couldn't break 600 because I didn't think I deserved it or was worthy or didn't dream big enough. Everybody else had tried it, missed it. I, I was going to be the first guy to do it in Ohio. I don't know. Why me? And then, you know, I had to figure out a way to, to dream a little bigger. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I figured that out, you know, but I had, to, I had to breed it in. And so I found myself knocking on the door way before I was ready to, to be that guy. I, was, I used to tell people, you know, when you bench 600, when you do that, then you got to be that guy for the rest of your life. You got to own up to that. You got to mm -hmm. live up to that. And if you're not ready to live up to that, you kind of balk. And so, again, about changing who I am, not lifting what I lifted, but changing who I am. I had to change myself into a guy that could live up to that. Mm -hmm. My body could do it. My training said it, you know, and I'm like, I'm self-sabotaging. I'm doing stuff wrong. And, and I had to change myself into a guy that dreamed big or bigger, didn't sell myself short, tried to have better expectations of myself, and then, and then go ahead and do it, and then go ahead and keep living up to that now. But that was a process. Lifting the weight is, is important, and we have to do it so we don't lose that goal because it still has to be that point of crystallization that we're moving towards. But that's not the real reward. The real thing is being a different person getting to that reward. I couldn't have got that reward at being this guy. Mm -hmm. I'd become a different guy to be able to do it. But what, what, what happens when you, when you bench what you wanted to bench or squat what you wanted to squat? Almost immediately, you set another goal. That's mm -hmm. not that goal. Okay. Five more. Oh, because you always left someone on the platform, right? There was four. It didn't go so well. So yeah. So how long well. does that? How long does that accomplishment last? Well, okay. it lasts your whole it's life. Fleeting. Huh? Well, it's yes, it, yes, it lasts your whole life. It's it one thing, but it's also very fleeting. Yeah. Fifteen seconds. But, <laughs> the, just but the person I am, I'm still that guy. <laughs> I'm still that guy that that I changed myself into through this process, and that's what I get to keep. I can't lift six hundred pounds now, but I but I'm still the guy that I had to become to be able to be a guy that could lift 600 pounds. Yes. And that's the real reward. And to do that, getting back to, do we need to look at others? Yeah, I had to look at the 600 because that was, that was, that was important to me to be the first guy in Ohio to do it, you know? And I hadn't been to Westside yet. And I, I had this misguided idea that I should do it on my own. Mm -hmm. No, no, don't, don't get any help. And I wanted to do that before I went out there. Mm -hmm. And that's misguided. But you have to look at that. You have to have the point outside yourself. You have to have the vision and you have to, and you have to look at others to get that vision. Mm -hmm. But to go from where you are to, to that place, I don't have to look at anybody but me. Here's where I am. What's the next thing I have to do? Now I'm here. What's the next thing I have to do? And, and, and we still have to have that overarching vision. Mm -hmm. I always quote this, where, where there is no vision, the people perish. Yes. I can compete against everybody else in the world, and I can compete against myself, and they're not mutually exclusive. I don't have to choose one or the other all the time. Here you had, you know, um, Ken Lane for injury prevention, Ted R. City. You had a, a short call with him where he told you to expect more. He did. Wait, that's Let me why tell that I brought story? that up because that's what we were just talking about. Let me tell that story. Dude. Yeah. Uh, if, if it's all right. Yes. So I was working for Buckeye Barbell and they had, and Ted R.C. had just come out with some line of like supplements of some sort and uh, they were going to sell them for him. So they were talking to him on the phone and I just benched 500, 500 and I was done. I did what I came to do. I, I didn't expect any more from myself. I didn't expect 500 ever. But I did it, and I was really happy with it. 
And so I worked the phones for them and they had Ted call me. And I'm like, you know, hello, and uh, do the mm-hmm. thing. And he's good. JM, this is Ted Ossid. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. And I, I knew it was possible because mm-hmm. I'd never heard his voice before, but I knew it was possible. Cause, and, and the conversation went, you know, he, he congratulated me. It was very brief, mm-hmm. but man, did it have impact. It was very brief. He said, you know, congratulations. I heard you bench 500 pounds. I'm like, yeah, thank you so much. He said, you know, JM, what comes after five? I said, yep, Ted, I already got it. I think I'm going to go for 515 next. And then he goes, no. After five comes six. After six comes seven. And and thinking big. He was thinking in 100-pound jumps, <laughs> 500, 600 yeah, next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not 505, 510. But just that, just that you could be, that you could dream that big. And if you worked hard enough, you could pull it off. Just the thought that this guy is so audacious and he had been 700 pounds. And, and this guy's so audacious that he thinks in hundred pound jumps, he's out there thinking in hundred pound jumps, maybe I, maybe I should think a little bigger too mm-hmm. at, at what I, where I could end up at. How long do you think this conversation was? A minute. A minute. He just, he was just being nice. No, but one person being nice for one minute can change somebody's perspective to go on to break more records. It did. It did. 